Mahavala Rakadashlaram. It has been a while since I've read a book this good. Uh, definitely top three uh, micro book, microbial books, epidemiology books that I've ever read. And given COVID-19, you should probably read this book. Now, I want to go over some of the ideas in this book as to why it's go so good. But before I do that, let me just say that she is a science journalist, the author of this book, who actually understands science with like a very high level understanding almost like comparable to a scientist, and it's written very well. Um, the prose in the book is good, right? Her writing style is terrific. Uh, I wish I could write as good as her, okay? <laughs> um, what are some of the ideas that make this book so good? So first of all, the book is actually like quite systematic. It's almost like if you were to take a textbook, okay, and you make like an introductory textbook, but instead of just talking about theories and ideas, you just go to straight up examples, and you kind of like make them in a chronology. It's like every discovery we made about microbes, she like did a chronology, but she did the actual discoveries. And a lot of our discoveries of like events related to microbes were actually like in foreign countries. It wasn't like in labs. Um, sometimes it was in labs and she covers that, but it was also a lot of discoveries with, like, with regards to like outbreaks, sources of outbreaks, how it spread, done in foreign countries, usually in, in Africa. Um, so for that reason, like this book is really good, right? It's like a, it's like an introductory textbook, but like written in a journalist way. Now, why do I recommend this book so hard? Like so hard? It's because some of the ideas uh, in this book are terrific. Um, let's start with like, like for example the spread of microbes. The way she explains the spread of microbes. There is one example of um, in Bolivia during political unrest. Okay, she links political unrest to the spread of microbes. What happens is people in Bolivia, 1950s, maybe early 60s, there was political unrest. Uh, a lot of people were being moved away from their homes. And as they were doing this, they needed a way to live. And since they didn't have wages anymore, they had to do subsistence farming, okay? So basically, they have to live off the land. Well, one of the ways they lived off the land is they cut down the rainforest, <laughs> or they cut down the forests that were by them. And when you do that, you destroy habitats of animals, and these animals have viruses in them that you haven't been exposed to. And one of, one of, the, one of the examples in here was the uh, rodent, something like Malchus, I forget its name, something with an M. And it was carrying a viral hemorrhagic fever. And what it would do is, as people would cut down the forest, these rodents would spread out. And in these new houses, these villages that they built, the rodents would then urinate in the kitchens because they were eating corn, right? Uh, the rodents loved the corn more than the food they were getting at the forest to begin with. And as a result of that, they could reproduce more because it was a more steady food supply. And they would urinate in the kitchens as they ate the corn. And their urine would contain these, these viral hemorrhagic fever particles, okay? As the morning came about, the grandmothers in Bolivia would sweep the kitchen floor. And when they would sweep the kitchen floor, these particles, these urine particles, would fly into their food. And they would eat it. On top of eating it, which already made them sick, they would then go to like, the main cities to see the doctors because they didn't have them in the villages. So they would travel and spread it as well. And so here you have one example of just uh, deforestation, like cutting down forests, leading to new diseases that uh, can be spread. Um, there's also some very interesting stuff about uh, microbial resistance in this book. There's a good example of uh, in Southeast Asia, there was a lot of mines being found. And when they were looking for these mines, they would just dig up randomly holes into the ground. Uh, and that would leave huge craters for mosquitoes to then reproduce, and they would spread malaria. So the way these miners that would live by these big craters would combat malaria is they would engage in like black market medicine, where they'd buy malaria drugs from the black market. Because the average doctor in these Southeast Asian countries all already was getting paid five USD a month, right? something like really small. And so they just didn't have the resources. And as a result, the price of the malaria drugs became expensive, and so people couldn't get proper dosages. They couldn't uh, take the full course of the medication. They would just take what they can get. And that would lead to resistance. Uh, the malaria would become resistant to the drug because people would expose it to the drug, but it, they wouldn't do enough exposure that it would kill it. And so the microbe would adapt and respond and basically become resistant to the uh, malaria medicine. Um, Another interesting one had to do with like uh, farmers giving low-dose antibiotics to their cows. Farmers would give low-dose antibiotics to their cows. As a result, uh, a strain of salmonella came about that was resistant to antibiotics. Now, it didn't spread to humans that much. There was only one case where it did, but it sure as hell spread to all the other livestock, which killed a lot of cows. Uh, yeah, there's just so many um, interesting little stories 
that teach us about the spread of microbes in this book, basically. And for that reason, I strongly recommend reading this book. If you can get your hands on this, uh, read this. I think this book might even be better than the Spillover book. But again, it's like a textbook, but told through stories. That being said, 